Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at CrossFit Auto Body, located in Union City. CrossFit Auto Body is the perfect place to begin your fitness journey. Come in and become part of the CrossFit community. Visit uccrossfitautobody.com for more information. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. In today's episode, Scott sits down with Paige Burcham, who is the owner of Joann's here in Union City, Tennessee. Paige gives us the story on how Joann's came to be. Hello, I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week we celebrate our little section of the South as we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of our home here in West Tennessee. While today's guest is very much at home and is well known here in Union City, She's also an icon in the beauty pageant world, supplying gowns to competitors literally around the world. Welcome, Paige Bertram Dennis. Howdy. (laughs) How are you today? Oh, I'm really good. Fantastic. So my favorite quote that I've read from you, and and I hope it is truly from you, uh, but just in case, here we go. It was, we dress everything from the prom queen to the drag queen and everything in between. That's right. Is that you? That's right. No shame. Well, tell me about tell me about Joanne's gowns. What what is it? Where is it? How how did you become the proprietor of such an incredible place? Well, one of the unique things about Joanne's is we're a second generation family owned business. We're located in downtown Union City, just a little far away, maybe a mile here from the Discovery Park of America, and we're located in the center of the two hundred block of downtown and we're in the cornerstone building that also houses main street in the back of the building which is the community uh, development organization for our downtown so you can't miss us with the black and white striped awning huge windows out front and three stories which we currently utilize two stories of that Um, what we do for the past 33 years we've been located i'm a second generation proud family business owner. My mother is Joanne. Hence, a lot of people still call me Joanne when they walk in the door, and that's okay. I find it very flattering. And she still works there, right? She still comes in. Okay. She's really uh, avid about telling people, and you can tell them the real Joanne helped you. (laughs) So (laughs) it makes it kind of interesting, and I enjoy having her. She works maybe one day, uh, two days a month, but it's it's always a joy to see her come in and tell me what I'm doing wrong. So... uh, A true family business. She's the master, Uh, and we can't let her forget that her name's (laughs) on the door, even if she doesn't own it. (laughs) So um, I was lucky enough to acquire the business from my mother when she approached retirement age, and it's been 15 years ago. Now, I mentioned she's still working, so I guess it goes hand-in-hand with retirement and still working is kind of the norm nowadays, but also she does it uh, to help with the organization and things that we're doing. We have 12 employees. Um, Some of those are seasonal. We do have full-time employees, and it's a growing business. We're thriving, surviving, and people like coming to downtown Union City, and they like the fact that glitter runs in our veins. (laughs) Now, you literally... Um, have people coming in from everywhere for their gowns, right? Yeah. I mean, um, we just uh, worked with Miss Alaska, and so she's outside of Anchorage. And then last year's Miss Alaska was from Wasilla, Sarah Palin's niece. So she flew in um, on Alaskan Airlines to St. Louis and then had a car service here and stayed several days in Union City. And we have girls that do that from all over the country. I say Alaska because it's kind of extreme. People would think, wow, you know, you're coming from Alaska to Union City, Tennessee. But um, we we work with girls from all over the country, and it there's something special about um, the time, realizing the amount of time that you put in and traveling with your mother or your director or if you are looking for a dress for a photo shoot or we have celebrity stylists 
that come in, you know, being close to Nashville, they can find things they don't have in Nashville, believe it or not. Um, we have uh, franchise licensing agreements statewide on several of the lines we ca- carry, whether it's a Lebanese line or an American-made line. And so a lot of these stylists come to Union City to pick for who they're working with, whether it be uh, Carrie Underwood or, or another artist who we have dressed Carrie before. And you also dressed Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah. And you, you, you designed the dress in Country Strong, is that right? That's right. Um, Gwyneth, uh, the movie poster that was put out, and you can see it if you Google the trailer for Country Strong that starred Kim, Tim McGraw and uh, Gwyneth, uh, they contacted me, and Gwyneth really wanted a look that was Tennessee-made, kind of a Tennessee-created look that would in, all-encompass um, the Nashville feel, uh, the little bit of a less is more look is what I like to say in country music. Um, you know, they want less, but more is more, you know? So we designed something for her and that dress became a hit. I mean, I, right after we designed that dress, uh, 1400 of those gowns later, um, all over the world. So it made in three different colors. So yeah, we were thrilled to dress Gwyneth and I really appreciated uh, the shout out she gave us and the the memorabilia is something that uh, we're kind of proud of. We might need to do an exhibit of that here at hey, Discovery Park. We can one of do that. A Joanne's uh, display would be really cool, wouldn't it? You know, I think it would be cool. One, I think it would be great to also focus on um, some of the other gowns that you know, take place from years ago. Uh, even some of the local people in the community showing their prom gown or their wedding gown or, you know, Kelly Cash's from Mylan, her Miss America gown from 1987, Johnny Cash's niece. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we still dress her today. So that's a, that's a, we're, we're brainstorming here now. Yeah. I, think, I think we can make something happen with that. There you go. Um, so back me up a little bit to, okay. to your, so, so uh, Little Page, yeah. you grew up locally. Right. So right tell here. me about your childhood and when did your mom first dis- discover that she had this gift for gowns? Well, I think she discovered it by accident. I come from a large family by today's standards and um, I grew up in Woodland Mills, ten- Tennessee, right down the road here. You could probably throw a rock from the tower mm-hmm. here at Discovery you Park. You can see it for sure. You that. can for yeah. sure see it. And my family is from Hickman, Kentucky, but my parents settled in Woodland Mills and I went to Woodland Mills Elementary School when it still existed, and then later Lake Road Elementary. And I decided I wanted to do the Miss Lake Road pageant. Now, this is kind of a big task, being as I had braces, inch thick glasses, acne, and really wasn't very attractive. <laughs> so my mother knew the dress would be very important. <laughs> uh, sadly, uh, we didn't have the financial resources to really get a great dress. So my mother thought, you know, there's got to be a place we can find a dress somewhere. And she bought one at a yard sale, and she said she's never been so embarrassed in her life. I look terrible. But it could have been the braces and the glasses. <laughs> but uh, from that, someone wanted that dress, and she got a dress from someone else and then traded a dress. And next thing you know, we have like five dresses in our uh, den. And the next thing you know, we had seven and then 12 gowns, and my mother said, this is a business. And literally from that, it was organically grown into what it is today. Was she, was she already a seamstress? I mean, no, did she you know, sew or? You know, she, she didn't really sew that much. She could do minor alterations uh, for me. Um, but it really was just something that just kind of grew out of, out of the ground here. And um, it continues to grow today. Um, we've seen every year. Our numbers go up and up, but a lot of it has to do with the um, the type of way we the way we treat the customer. Um, it's an experience, and we realize that is an experience. So it's not like going to your big box retailer, even though they don't carry our garments. Um, we provide personal stylists for everyone that walks in the door. So so walk me. Let's let's pretend like mm-hmm. I am uh, competing. In the Miss... Howdy, Scott. <laughs> what, what should Looks it be, Looks like Luke? you were maybe size 16. <laughs> yeah, probably. I don't know. Uh, a 34, 32. <laughs> um, what, um, what would you... Walk me through the whole process. I'm competing in the Miss Strawberry pageant, hoping to be Miss Tennessee. 
Well, the Strawberry Festival doesn't go to Miss Tennessee. Oh, uh, but, oh. so you need to get me in the right pageant, first of all. <laughs> but let's say you were in the Strawberry Festival, which is really a lot of heritage right here okay. uh, in West Tennessee. The Humboldt Strawberry Festival, which we are the official sponsor for, oh, perfect. is a wonderful, wonderful pageant. I didn't even know that when I threw that That's out there. Okay. It's fortuitous. I mean, we love the fruit and vegetable events right around West Tennessee and West Kentucky. Mm-hmm. But uh, the Strawberry Festival pageant is unique because of the history and tradition and in the 16 to 21 age group and scott i think you may have aged out darn uh, it but (laughs) i was so hopeful we would bring you in and talk about every phase of competition we would set you down we wouldn't look at dresses first we would talk about what your goals are are your goals just to be in this pageant? Or is there other pageants or other events that you want this dress to cross-pollinate into? And come up with really what you need. And once we identify that need, we'll look for something to meet that need. Based upon your budget, we have gowns from $299 to recently we sold a dress for $19,000. Oh, wow. So, I, I wouldn't be able to afford that one. <laughs> well, this young lady, actually what she needed it for uh, was several different events. It wasn't necessarily a pageant as a whole, and she uh, had a sponsor that wanted her to wear a particular type of dress, and that's why she she drove eight hours, and so we custom made her this dress. And, and it's an investment. Well, in what it was, she was a, doing. She got a finale dress from New York Fashion Week, mm-hmm. and so uh, this young lady uh, had watched New York Fashion Week and had seen one of the particular designers because we as a store go twice a year to New York Fashion Week in the spring and the fall. And uh, we don't have front row seats, but we do have great seats. You're there. We're there. And um, we tend to show that on our social media and different things. And she had witnessed this dress walk the runway. She just had to have it for the event she was looking for. So, you know, we would talk about what your budget was and what your needs are and then we would find something to meet those needs and try on from there and it could be that that gown is in the store hanging we have a thousand gowns in the store not and do you do you do you have people there that actually i don't know a lot about the clothing okay. business. do they actually sew the dresses there in the where you are do you we get do in New York we or? we do have alterations that take place in the store but we also custom design so um on regular basis is we have celebrity designers that come in. Mm. This weekend, we have a designer, Juan Carlos Panera, that's coming in um, from um, Miami. And uh, we deal with a couple of different Miami designers, but he is famous for making the Victoria's Secret corset. Oh, sure. And so now he puts that into evening gowns, and he's from Cuban descent. Um, But we will be making his garments... uh, to the specifications for our clientele that we have over the next three days. And most of those people stay here in Union City or at South Fulton Fulton at the Meadows Hotel, which is our host hotel that we work with, and um, dine and spend their dollars. And they shop in downtown Union City, whether it be at the Chocolate Bunny or the Delta Bell and Sisters Antiques and some of the great other places that we have to offer. Yeah, you know, we'll have a hotel right here next door. I know. I love the Meadows, too, though. Yeah, That's, I, I always tell people to check out the Meadows. Oh, yeah. And then we'll have hotels right here next it, door. It's great because, you know, we, we do sell the hotel out sometimes, so it's great to have you know, other locations. So we would f- fix you up, Scott. We would find exactly what you need. I mean, how high a heel can you wear? Um, probably flats. Can, well, I, can I compete in flats? We may have to uh, get started and just see what you look like. Um, so um, you have people that come here from all over the world, so you're definitely an international business. I know you said you go to New York. Do you also go to other countries? I know you've mentioned Hong Kong. Do you, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, I used to work uh, for a Chicago-based Indian-owned manufacturer for many years before I settled full-time back home. And... Um, designing gowns that were carried uh, across the country and world. And I did lived in uh, China about three months a year. So I did that until 2012, and I would make several trips back and forth and, of course, go to the fabric markets in Paris looking for different threads and things and specialty embroidery that we could uh, incorporate into the collections. So I, I don't do that anymore. I came back home um Bought a house in the town where I graduated high school, which was South Fulton, and um, 
got four acres of land and a nice pond with some fish in the back and two five-month-old twins. So so here's the question is why? Why not Atlanta or, right. you know, you could live anywhere really and, and do what you do. What, what about coming home is appealing for you? You know, I was talking to a TV newscaster one time and I used to um, also work in television some and still do some things in television. And one of the things she said is the goal of TV newscasters, and this is when it hit me. She said, you either want to go big or go home. Mm -hmm. And that's how it is in TV news. You either want to make it to the network or go home. I felt like I made it to the network, and then I was ready to go home. And when I come back home, there's something about seeing old cousin Jim at the gas station or Mr. Larry that used to run the mail route at Walmart or wherever you grocery shop or and and visiting those friends because there truly is something to be said in the phrase there is no place like home. It it is fun to sit in a restaurant and know half the people in the room. I've only been here less than 6 months and I- I go eat, and I know half the people in the restaurant. Well, it sure makes you put your mascara on, Scott, when you go out of the house, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, see, I've not been doing that, so maybe I'm supposed to be doing that. Um, so um, so you're you're running this business here at home. You know, you're, right. you've got the stocked pond. And what, what are the challenges of trying to run a global business in a rural community like this? You know, I think one of the things is – you know, people have to, A, appreciate what you do, and I think we've established that, and they have to, B, know that you are the place to go. And once you have established that, you can do it. Now, logistically, people say, Union City, how am I going to get there? Well, all roads lead to Union City. Oh, I like that. We need to put that tag somewhere. <laughs> all roads lead, you know, it doesn't, you can get here any way you want, mm-hmm. bus, train, Plane, automobile, we'll, we, we'll pick you up anywhere and get you to Joanne's. We've got an airport right here in Union City. You do. You do. And, you know, also we have a commercial airline, a smaller one, but I've flown it just last week uh, into Jackson. Mm-hmm. It flies to Atlanta and St. Louis. It's just so convenient. And uh, Paducah, Kentucky as well. So there's really... Um, and Memphis, the Memphis airport. Memphis, yeah. I mean, we have... We're just one stop away from the world, really, mm-hmm. right here in Union City. And I've taken the Amtrak train many times to Chicago, and then you can also go to New Orleans. And if if you've never utilized the Amtrak train, it's definitely something to uh, think about. So, but yeah, I mean, it, there is challenges in explaining to people how to get here. But if you have it, they will come. And we have the product, and we have the um, ability to help make you feel like a queen whether it's a drag queen, pageant queen, prom queen, (laughs) or uh, coronation ball, or, you know, we do a lot of people for special events, too. So we customize Mother of the Bride gowns. We do gowns uh, for balls and governor's events and things like that, inaugurations, all that good stuff. You know, all of that is done right here. You know, I made an outfit the other day for a girl who was a baton twirler, you know, at a um, in Purdue. So, you know, we we do a lot of You do it all. Things. Yeah. Um, you were one of the very early um, people who had a reality show. Um, you know, now all these years later, I think most of us have been on a reality show at one time <laughs> or another. But you were right out there on the forefront. Um, was that a positive experience? Oh, uh, definitely. Um you know, in the very beginning, when we did the reality show, it was I was on another reality show, and I got cast for that show as um, hosting a fashion show. Oh, and so I did that, and you know, from there I met the crew, and they won. They said, "Oh, you're a show," and I said, oh, "Yeah, yeah." Until they showed up in Union City at my business, did I believe <laughs> them? These guys flew in from New York, and I said. Oh, expletive. Wow. <laughs> they really think that I am. And from there, we were able to um, um, get our own show. We really, I never really thought that it would happen, you know. And I, uh, TV's Hurry Up and Wait. And um, 
we filmed the teaser, and I thought, I don't think this is going to go. And sure enough, it did, and we signed a full season. And uh, we're still being shown uh, in other countries, real popular in the Philippines, as a matter of fact. And now I've worked on a couple of TV projects since then, and I'm currently working on another project uh, with uh, the USA Network. I've already filmed some things for that. So we're really excited about new projects that, even if I can't go into full details uh, on the podcast, that are with uh, some very important people that are very prominent in cable television right now. Very fun. And that, that was going to be my question is what's next? So you've got these yeah. projects. What what else is next for you? and your? Are you, how, how old are your twins? I've got five-month-old twins. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So when I say what's next, sleep is yeah. probably next for you. Well, I'm, I'm lucky that they're really good kids. Um, so, I mean, I'm, they're getting some – getting sleep themselves so that allows me to uh get some sleep but you know hopefully the next thing is i'll be baby proofing my house i think because we're already turning over and i feel like they're going to be crawling soon and i think you have to buy all these apparatuses to i mean you know let's face it i'm not a spring chicken and they (laughs) are so i have a feeling that i'm going to be going okay which one do i tackle (laughs) as they're both running to destroy uh parts of the house but you know, it's a season in life, and when it comes to having children, I knew that I needed to do that at home mm-hmm. and, um, you know, let my parents, who still live in the area, who live in Inglewood Lake down toward Real Foot Lake, have the opportunity to experience that and uh, be grandparents. So the next thing is just uh, my business is going to continue. Um, it's, I mean, like I said, this has been our best year ever. Oh, congratulations. So far. That's yeah, great. I mean, it just keeps growing by leaps and bounds. As a matter of fact, we just expanded, uh, and we haven't done our grand opening on that to um, um, 2,200 square feet um, upstairs to our luxury level. So The luxury level? Luxury level, well, now, if yeah. If you knew me, you'd know. I, I'm going for the luxury level. Well, we're going to have a full champagne bar oh. and everything set up. It's got uh, mirrors and... Um, a private dressing area and posh seating and, and suits, no men suit. suit. No, no, but you can go to suits. Bennett's for five seasons. Oh, two I, lo- other I love those. I love both those places and get some uh, nice studs there. But people would be shocked the oh. level of uh, apparel one can buy here in both men's and women's clothing. I think the thing that people don't realize, and I've said this before, your downtown merchants and your local business owners provide a level of service that you cannot get at a big box retailer. When it comes to buying a gift or buying yourself a garment, having free personal stylist, free gift wrapping, and that touch, that really that personal touch of what you need is so important. It's something you can't get in the malls or at big box retailers. And the downtown merchants, I'm going to tell you, we're the ones that buy the annual ads. We're the ones that help sponsor the T-ball team. We're the ones. So when you give back and try to shop at home, not just in the holiday season, but when someone has a birthday or, or someone has a special event, just coming by and just seeing what we have, making it a part of your monthly routine or weekly routine, we appreciate it because that foot traffic is great. And social media is so big. So just checking yourself in at a location or sharing a picture on Snapchat, if you're tech savvy or any of those things you may do, we really value that. And we try hard as a downtown association to keep up that foot traffic and give you a reason to come. And we have lots of events throughout the year. And with our parks and um our Easter egg hunts and our taste event, the Kintin, Taste of Kintin in the park, lots of things. So you can come downtown and you can come to Discovery Park and you can do it all in one day. Yeah. No, it's, it is an amazing uh, an amazing town to live in. Um, 
I, when uh, after we had first moved here, I asked my wife, "Why is everybody so well dressed in this town?" And it's because we have these great clothing stores, Aww, and um, awesome. you know, my wife and I like Soleil to buy, you know, check, oh, check that wonderful. out. Yeah. You know, for I, I think it's really important for people to really support, you know, their local merchants. Um, it's really, really important. It's the backbone of your education system too, for your tax dollars to give mm-hmm. back to the schools. So it's so important to remember that. And your local museum, I think. Oh, and your museum, <laughs> yeah, your right. local museum. Museum. Well, thank you so much for taking us behind the scenes in the oh, pageant world. It's been it's been really fun talking to you. Um, so thank you for coming. Hey, we're open seven days a week. We want you to come by and see us and go to Discovery Park all on the same day. So if you're a prom queen, a drag queen, or anything in between, and you want to check out the coolest dress shop in the world, you can first go online to Joann's Prom and Pageant Gowns.com. Or check us out on Instagram at Joann's of Union City. And Facebook. And Facebook, Joann's, and keep up with the daily glitter distribution. Oh, see, there you go. And then um, when you're done and she's got you all ready for the competition, stop over here at Discovery Park of America and and check out the new exhibit that's coming in 2023 maybe that's of right. the gowns of Obion County or whatever <laughs> whatever we decide the to The gowns of glitter. Yeah, Luke, would you go to that? Luke would go. Oh, yeah. I can tell. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. And now taking us behind the scenes for a little uh, glitter discovery magic of his own is my friend and Discovery Park of America education champion, Andrew Gibson. Okay, thank you, Scott. And on today's episode of the Real Foot Forward podcast, we have a very special guest, uh, docent extraordinaire here at Discovery Park of America, Travis Crump. Travis is a docent here, like I said, um, who is interested in, you're, you're a history guy, right? Yeah, generally. Generally yeah. history. Uh, so one of the things, uh, do you like focusing on world history or kind of local history or what do you, what do you, what do you like to enjoy? What do you what do you like to focus on? A little bit of everything. My degree is in political science, so anything involving uh, House of Cards esque stuff is always in my uh, repertoire. Um, stuff including Real Foot Lake, Real Foot Lake, and the history behind the Night Riders okay. of Real Foot Lake is super interesting to me. So Real Foot Lake was made in the earthquake of 1811, 1812. Mm-hmm. Um, water from the Mississippi River spilled over into a low-lying basin and created what is now Rufford Lake. Around this time period, the Chickasaw Indians were pushed out under President Andrew Jackson during the Trail of Tears. And so settlers started moving into the area that became New Madrid. About 500 people lived there in 1870, which is kind of where the story starts. So around 1870, a businessman named James Harris started silently buying up land around the area. Um, there were farmers who had died, their land became vacant, people moved away. So he starts slowly buying up land directly bordering the lake. He made agreements with farmers that they continue to farm and live on the land at no cost to them. He was just the owner of the property, technically. And over the next 30 years, he buys up all this land and controls a majority of the land around the lake. And in 1899, claims that he technically owns the lake in the same way that you would like own a pool if you own all the area directly next to the pool at your house. And so this angered a lot of people. And so he makes a plan to start draining water off the lake so that he has more land to grow cotton. The area around it is fertile, but the area that is covered by water would be more fertile in his mind. So he ends up getting taken to court by a number of prominent farmers and fishermen around the area claiming that this would completely destroy their livelihood. And the case goes all the way to the Tennessee Supreme Court. The case kind of hinged on this definition of what they call navigable waters, which is kind of weird to define. It's basically, can you put a boat on it and make it all the way across? Which at this time, James Harris has already started draining water off the lake. So when the Tennessee Supreme Court goes to test this theory, it's, they can't make it across stumps are all throughout the lake anyway and with the less water on the lake it just made things worse so the tennessee supreme court ends up siding with james harris claiming that he can privatize the lake however the supreme court laid out this ruling in 1902 and james harris dies in january of 1903 so he can't do anything with it now and so the entirety of the land is given to his son judge harris who in 1907 founded what was known as the west tennessee land company 
which kind of was to insulate himself from future lawsuits. Instead of getting sued directly, they would sue the company. His father was actually bankrupted by this four-year lawsuit. So Judge also has this neat idea. Instead of draining water off the lake, why doesn't he just charge everyone who uses the lake? And so he starts charging farmers exorbitant amounts of rent and then starts charging fishermen money per pound of fish they caught, where if you live off the lake, this is killing you livelihood-wise. So he's trying to start a monopoly. Completely. Um, he's making a monopoly at the lake, like like you said, completely. Mm -hmm. So, okay, just making sure I'm following along. Just keep on going. He's almost like trying to turn it into a theme park where everything in and around the lake is nickel and dimed and directly into his pocket. So the families around the lake take him to court again and lose again. And at this point, they have to turn to more vigilante methods so, to protect their livelihood. Okay, so I'm going to pause you there for just a second. Now, when you're saying the families are on the lake, um, does, is he, does he own the land around the lake as well? Or is he just, you're, you're, when you're talking about the land around the lake that he owned, um, but the family's living on that land now? Yes, there were families living on their land. They had signed up legal contracts with his father, James, okay. that they could continue to live there. Okay. But then Judge kind of just burned those contracts up the second he got control. All right, just want to make sure I was still following on the story. Yeah, All right, absolutely. Con continue, continue. So vigilantes. So they begin to secretly form a group to kind of cause general mischief around the lake and kind of make Judge Harris's life as awful as possible. Three men in particular... Um, wealthy farmers by the name of Tom Johnson, Tom Wilson, and Garrett Johnson get together a group of almost 100 men, and they start calling themselves the Night Riders. And at first, they're not doing anything awful, but slowly and surely it goes from mischief to vandalism to arson. And then they end up committing numerous murders in the name of the Night Riders, some of which were personal matters that didn't have anything to do with J Judge Harris or the owning of the lake. Um, one such instance with Harris specifically, the Harris family lived in Nashville majority of the time. Judge Harris had moved to Real Foot Lake to personally oversee his new uh, theme park, I guess. When all this started happening, Judge sends his family back to Nashville and creates a fort out of his house with like six foot high wooden walls and booby traps and landmines all over the front lawn. And so the Knight Riders can't touch him. But what they do do is start burning down boat docks of Harris and all of his employees, including their fishing boats and any other sheds or things they can get access to. Um, slowly but surely, things escalate farther. Things get personal. For instance, uh, there was the murder of a man named David Walker. He was an African-American man who was visiting the lake from Hickman, Kentucky. And the story goes, the validity of the story notwithstanding, the story goes that he in drunkenly insulted a white woman who was at the lake, and when her husband showed up to defend her, he pulled a gun on him. The Night Riders that night followed Mr. Walker back to his house in Hickman, Kentucky, and when they began to burn his house down, Mr. Walker got he and his family out, and they were shot and killed trying to escape. So the Night Riders slowly but surely get this reputation of vigilante group to what we would consider today almost like a terrorist organization. Yeah. This all comes to a head in 1908. There were two lawyers from the company, one of which was named Quentin Rankin and the other uh, Robert Taylor, who came to Realfoot Lake to kind of try to talk to local businessmen and kind of form a truce of sorts between the other businesses and kind of disband the Knight Riders from within. And they go to these negotiations and they go extremely poorly. And so a group of Knight Riders show up at their hotel in Walnut Log and kidnap the both of them. And they take him out to an area on the lake with large trees. And they begin to hang Quentin Rankin and put him down like every 30 to 45 seconds, just enough to make him like almost pass out. And they begin to ask him, are you going to give in? Are you going to give in? And he keeps telling them no. And eventually a gun goes off and Quentin is shot and killed. Now, whether or not the shot was on purpose or an accident or the group got together and decided to do it, no one really knows, but during the commotion, the other lawyer, Robert Taylor, jumps into the water with his hands bound, gets loose, but still swims across Real Foot Lake with his legs like completely tied and alerts police. 
At this point, the governor of Tennessee ends up sending in the National Guard to basically put Lake County under militia control or martial law, I guess. And the Bayan County Sheriff's Department actually moved into Lake County and took over Lake County Sheriff's Department because they were feared that Lake County Sheriff's Department was corrupted and that members among them were part of the Night Riders that were going to kind of make this investigation difficult. And what year was this? This is in 1908. Okay. This is uh, towards the end of 19, uh, yeah, towards the end of 1908. This is in late summer, September, October kind of time. So during this, two trials happen. Over 100 men that were supposedly part of the Night Riders are arrested, but only eight are ever brought to court, one of them being Garrett Johnson, who was one of the original conspirators of this group. However, due to lack of evidence and the fact that nobody's talking, the entire case gets thrown out due to lack of evidence. So no one is technically punished because of this. However, Lake County stayed under martial law until the Supreme Court actually reversed their decision in 1909, stating that due to the fact that you could get a boat about across Realfoot Lake now, that it was navigable waters and therefore public territory, and the Harris Empire kind of fell apart. Uh, one last note to the story. So did the, did the state absorb all of that land? It absorbed the lake. The okay. land is still private owned, but no one can own the water itself. So the land, who's on, who owns the land? Still that family? As far as, as far as I understand at this point, the family still owns it. Okay. Last note to this story, Judge Harris drowned on the lake in 1913, and it was legally declared an accident. So for, for, for those of you that are engrossed in this story as much as I am, um, you can learn more about the Night Riders of, uh, of Real Foot Lake, uh, which is located here in northwest Tennessee, um, right up the road here from Discovery Park of America. And you can learn more about them actually here at Discovery Park of America. We do have an exhibit on them up in our regional history gallery. Um, once again, guys, thank you so much for listening. Um, my name is Andrew Gibson. I'm here with Travis Crum. And uh, once again, guys, thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.